Good morning and welcome to our online service of morning prayer, celebrating God's creation. We begin with our call to worship. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then shall the earth bring forth her increase, and God, our own God, will bless us. Our opening prayer. God, our Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer, you make known your wisdom in the variety and unity of your creation. Help us to pray to you in faith, to proclaim your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. confession. Human sin disfigures the whole creation which groans with eager longing for God's redemption. We confess our sins in penitence and faith. We take a moment just to bring before the Lord those things we have done and should not have done and the things we haven't done that we should have done. You delight in creation, its colour and diversity. Yet we have misused the earth and plundered its resources for our own selfish ends. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You have brought order out of chaos, light out of darkness, good out of evil, but we have preferred darkness, bring a dishonour to your holy name. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. You have showered us with blessings, but we have been grudging towards others and lacking in generosity in word and deed. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May the Almighty and merciful Lord 
Grant us pardon and forgiveness for all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come to our thanksgiving. We bless you, Lord, for the beauty of the trees, for the softness of the air, the fragrance of the grass. We bless you, Lord, for the soaring of the skies, the rhythm of the earth, the stillness of the night. We bless you, Lord, for the twinkling of the stars, for the freshness of the morning, for the dew drops on the flower. We bless you, Lord, for the taste of good food, for the trail of the sun and the life that never goes away. Heavenly Father, we enjoy the blessings of your creation. May we take up our responsibilities to care for all you have given us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the colic for today. God, our Judge and Saviour, teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love that we may live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now we have our Bible readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigners stronghold a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honour you, cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading is taken from Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14, the parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, Tell those people that I have invited and to my dinner that I have prepared it. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. 
So go to the street corners and invite anyone to the banquet you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man who was not wearing any wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without any wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. The king told his, his attendants to tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Glory to you, O Lord. May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. People have parties for all sorts of reasons. In this age of binge drinking, some of it seems to be to help people cope with the awful things that happen to them. But parties can also be to celebrate significant events birthdays, weddings, baptisms, retirements, even funerals. Sometimes parties just have a value in themselves. They bring people together in all sorts of ways. People who haven't met for some time come together and often renew friendships. We are able to thank people for the things they've done for us and what they mean to us. They are events which can create community, but if they go wrong, they can destroy us. Well, imagine the scene. An invitation to a formal dinner party drops through your letterbox. Panic sets in as the person it's intended for rushes upstairs. You hear drawers open, then slammed shuts, wardrobes opened and stuff being thrown everywhere amidst all sorts of shouting after what seemed like hours, you go up to see what's happening and what all the noise is about. And also to ask if you can help. And you're met with a huge mound of clothes on the floor. Litter everywhere. Uh, pants and socks thrown amongst bookshelves. And a dangerously bulging wardrobe door bursting at the seams and your family member lets out a sort of strangled cry of anguish and despair as he announces I've got nothing to wear well is that a problem that affects people these days when they come to church? I think not. Gone, I think, are the days when I was small, when you would dress up in your Sunday best. Yet, week by week, notices, posters, online advertisements are there for invitations to a place of worship. And inevitably, there's at the end of the invitation, it's all are welcome. Do people give much thought about what to wear in church? Or do we take some advice from a few verses in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel, starting at verse 28? 
and why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They don't toil or spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these flowers. So what is the dress code for heaven? This parable about the wedding clothes is one of the most troubling I find in Matthew's Gospel. Luke's version is easier and tries to make fewer points. Matthew's version feels uncomfortable to read and ends with an outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, ending with the words, many are called, but few are chosen. This parable has an uncomfortable amount of violence in it. The killing of the king's servants and the retribution of the king who has the murderers killed and their city burned to the ground. The other uncomfortable aspect is the fate of the guest who turns up for the party with the wrong clothes. The guest arrives at the wedding feast without his wedding clothes and is bound up and thrown out into utter darkness. However, this isn't a parable about wearing the correct clothing for a wedding. If we look more closely and we can see that it's to do with what people make of the invitation God offers and how we respond to it. It's a story about consequences to actions and the difficulties that this can create in the area of faith. Jesus points this out when he tells us to think carefully about the dress code of heaven. His message was given to the people in Jerusalem who thought they already knew all about being religious and there was nothing more for them to do or to learn in what they believed or how they witnessed to their faith. Jesus had come preaching his kingdom message, but the temple goers had heard it all before, or so they thought. They paid their dues, they weren't particularly opposed to Jesus' message, but they had other priorities which needed their attention. When Jesus called them, they didn't respond. So others were called to the feast. And Matthew says that they were gathered from all corners and the bad and the good. So that the wedding hall was crammed full of people. But we're left thinking, what about the man with the wrong clothes? Here is the point that Jesus is making. The clothes stand for the kingdom values. The clothes stand for the Christian way of life. The image of clothing is used in other parts of the New Testament. Um, the odd verse in Colossians Ephesians and Galatians where 
The metaphor refers to the outward evidence of the inward transformation when a person is joined to Christ. Hearing the invitation is not enough. Going through the motions of religious behaviour is not enough. What matters to Matthew and surely what matters ultimately to Jesus is if you receive the love and grace of Jesus and don't respond with a Christian lifestyle which means humility, compassion, kindness and gratitude then to what extent can it be said that we're really following the Lord? To what extent can it be said of you that you are dressed for the Kingdom Party? The point of this story is that Jesus is telling the truth. The truth that political and religious leaders often try to hide. The truth that God's Kingdom in which love and truth and mercy and holiness reign. They are the clothes you need to wear for the wedding. And if you refuse to put them on, you are saying that you don't want to stay to the party. And seen in this light, how many of our churches practice this kind of testimony demanded by the kind of party in the Kingdom of God? How many individual Christians within our churches share the warmth and kindliness and joyfulness that's are what the good news is all about and share this with the people who come into our churches. The message for us here is that the wedding invitation has already gone out. The question is, can we manage to fit it in to our tight schedule? This is the invitation that changes our schedule and our life. The time when, will come when we will meet our host face to face, who will then look at what we're wearing and how that reflects how closely we have attempted to follow Christ. If we accept the invitation to his party, we can't refuse to conform to his gospel. Heaven's dress code is not about Versace or Gucci or Prada or the latest and most expensive clothing, all colour coordinated with all the matching accessories. The dress code of heaven is about what we're like on the inside and the outside. What we do, what we say, what we believe, who we are. Call the clothes, love and justice, truth and mercy, inclusion and, in and equality. Because that is what the Lord calls us to wear to his heavenly party. 
how many of our churches are filled with inappropriately dressed people. Not wearing the wrong clothes, but wearing the wrong attitudes to what Jesus calls them to be and to do. The Bible talks a lot about clothing, the leaves and the coat of many colours, a seamless robe, the armour of God, those dressed in white. But the dress code of the party in heaven is not made out of fabric and or fashion. It's the attitude and action of heart and mind and soul. So, accept the invitation, but dress with care. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have our hymn, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. the Apostles' Creed, we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we have our prayers of intercession.
Lord God, you are the Father of all people. We pray for our church and for your blessing to rest upon this church and this parish. We are grateful for its worship and fellowship, for those working to, to include members of our congregations and who are unable to be with us, for the care and teaching of the children and young people, for its nurture and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, help us to see the kind of church you need today. Help us to see the many and varied needs of our community and how we can serve through our words, prayers and actions. Hold up before us the vision of your kingdom, a kingdom of justice and mercy, truth and compassion. Help us to grasp the meaning of the gospel which you have entrusted to us. Give us grace to live by it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for the family of your church which stretches out all over the world, asking for your blessing upon our Christian brothers and sisters in other lands. Where they are a small minority, let them find strength in knowing you are with them. Where they are persecuted, let them find courage to continue faithful, knowing that you will never leave them. Where they are young in the faith, let your Holy Spirit build them up in the knowledge of your love. Where they are affluent and accepted, keep them constant in your service. As we are blessed by the prayers of others, May our prayer be a blessing to those who love and worship you in other lands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who seek to make peace in this divided world, for those agencies who travel to any country in the cause of peace, for governments who are prepared to send units for the difficult role of peacekeeping, for those who work on opposing sides in disputes between management and workers, for Christians and those of other faiths who quietly and steadfastly advocate and live in the way of peace and thereby work for its growth, and for ourselves, where we have known the bitterness which hatred and strife can create in families and between individuals, let us sow seeds of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who are ill or in need of God's help at this time. Lord God, hear our prayer for those who are ill, in hospitals, at home or wherever they may be. Give them courage, hope and peace, and the knowledge that you are present in their weakness, their pain and their suffering. May the skills and knowledge of those who care for the sick be fully used to help and to heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them. Give to them the strong comfort which no one else can give. Let them know the comforting power of the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And let us pray for the beauty of the world around us. Lord God, we praise and thank you for giving us so much to enjoy in this world. Open our eyes to see all the beauty around us as summer turns to autumn. Help us to appreciate your greatness in giving us the different seasons, each fulfilling our needs. Help us to safeguard them so that our children and future generations will benefit from the natural beauty which you have created. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our thanksgiving for the gifts that are offered. God of life, Saviour of the poor, receive with our gifts gratitude for your goodness penitence for our pride and dedication to your service in Jesus Christ our Lord, 
Amen. Gathering into all our prayers and praises, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The blessing. May God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of all goodness and growth, pour his blessing upon things, all things created, and upon us his children, that we may use his gifts to his glory and the welfare of all peoples. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. We come to our final hymn. Thy hand, O God, has guided. Tend the earth, care for God's good creation, and bring forth the fruits of righteousness. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.